Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, uh, sharing a bit of our knowledge uh, about airflow. Um, I'm a Brazilian girl in uh, a room here in London, UK. So let's start. Um, so in order, since this is quite a long session, um, I did the attempt of introducing some quizzes in the middle of the presentation. There will be both URLs or QR codes to help you joining. Uh, we can have up to 20 people joining the quiz per time. And I hope people will engage. Otherwise, it can be a bit boring, right? So please, please do join and participate. I would love to hear from you. So this is the QR code. You will be able to use it in other places as well. You can just use your phone, scan it, and make sure you will be able you will be able both to see the slides and also to participate of the the quizzes. Um, so Brian told a bit about me. So I'm a Brazilian living in London. Um, I graduated in computer engineering at Unicamp. I've been a, a passionate software developer for 18 years now. I've worked for the pri private and public sectors. Um, I already did things for medicine, media, and education. I love open source um, and uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I have a tiny daughter called Amanda, who will hopefully not join the session today. Um, I really love the Airflow community and the summit. Um, I have lots of people to thank, but I would like to particularly thank Tomek and Yarek uh, for the workshop they gave last in the last year's summit about helping people how to contribute um, to Airflow, Kaxel for reviewing the PR image, and I'm sorry for not making the changes you requested yet. Um, Ash and Leah for encouraging me to come here and share a bit of our experience. Um, so the work I'm presenting is, is done as part of a group. So within the BBC, which is a massive organization, we have Data Lab, whose mission is to apply machine learning to improve the experience of our audiences. And then within Data Lab, there are squads. And my squad is hummingbirds. Um, at the moment, we are 14 members, Darren, David, Richard, and I. Uh, but in the past, we had other people who contributed directly to what I'm going to present here. So um, special thanks to Bitten and Mark as well. Um, so first question, and I would love if people could engage with this. So how do you run Airflow? How, how are you using Airflow? So I voted already. So you can join the quiz by reaching out this URL. I will give some moments just for us to see how other people um, currently run Airflow. Um, so at the moment, my experience with, with, with using Google Cloud Composer. Um, at the BBC, I know there are teams who actually bundle um, Airflow in, in uh, containers. And, and serve them from VMs in AWS. But I know there are lots and lots of ways of serving, um, of using Airflow. Uh, in my talk, some aspects will be related to Google Cloud, but I'm hopeful that the lessons and the concepts I will be showing here, they will be meaningful um, regardless of which, how, where you use Airflow. Because the lessons in the end, they, they apply to many circumstances. Um, so that's very cool. So we're having a few participants there. So we have um, a fr huge fraction of people who run on premise, um, others who use another way, which I didn't mention explicitly, of 22% more or less who run in Google Cloud, some people who don't run it just at all, around 10%. Um, some people who are using in AWS, which is relatively new, some people an astronomer. So really good to see this diversity we have. Okay, I will move on. So a bit about how my squad is using Airflow. So 
we try to not break things and not to see this atomic bomb mushroom. And whenever that happens, it's already a good way of celebrating. So we used managed airflow. At the moment, we use a Cloud Composer. And we spin it up using Terraform. Um, we have, um, at least the version we're using of Composer, it uses salary executors. Um, and we're in a quite old version of data of Airflow at the moment. So we're using 11012, even though, uh, well, the community is releasing, just released a new version, right? And Google does offer more recent versions. Um, we aim to, to try to keep up to date to the versions, but not always it's possible. Um, so some of the types of operators we use at the moment. So we use large variety from base operator, batch operator, dummy operator, Python operator. Um, but the main ones we're using at the moment, which are critical for this particular work, for the group of workflows I will be presenting in this talk, are a Python operator. So we usually subclass it, and then we, we implement some behaviors. Uh, we uh, relate DAGs using the trigger DAG run operator. Um, we do delegate work as well to Kubernetes using the GKE pod operator. And we also use Apache Beam, uh, which is similar to Spark, and we use the Dataflow Python operator. So these uh, operators which are in bold are the ones which we use more often. Um, at the moment, we have several environments. So of course, we, we do develop a few things locally, and then we would deploy to dev, int, and proj. Uh, there were moments in our uh, history where we had multiple environments per environment. So we already had a moment we had up to three composer environments in dev, uh, but we try to keep it to the minimal necessary since there is a cost associated to that. And the application my squad has been focused on delivering has been to deliver a recommendation engine and Airflow is really critical for what we're building. So um, we use it um, both for ETL, to actually extract, transform, and load data, uh, both user activity and also content metadata, particularly program metadata. Uh, we ingest from some data sources, we process the data, we shape it in the way that it's meaningful. We train a machine learning model uh, we output the model, and then we predict recommendations for millions of users. And, and then after that, we currently even trigger um, the new recommendations to be available for the end users through APIs. Uh, so this is the overview of the tasks we're executing at the moment using Airflow. And these are how the DAGs looked like in April 2021. So um, how the user ingest looks like, how the program metadata ingest looks like, how the train model looks like, and also how we pre-compute recommendations. Um, so given that we have all these things here, um, I would like to see, so we have three DAGs here. Um, I would like to see if people can guess which of these four pipelines we have is the most stable one. So here I will start the quiz. Oh, let's see. So which is our most stable DAG? Get ready. So I'm curious to know if people have any clue. So I will give some more hints on what type of data we have in each of these things. Um, OK, I did set up very poorly. So uh, who participated thought that the most uh, stable DAG we have is the content metadata, which is quite a good guess. Because um, in theory, you would have less uh, content 
than users' activity, for instance. And it can be less tricky than training a model, which might require lots of CPU and memory. Um, and it might be less challenging than computing recommendations for lots and lots of users. Um, but in reality, our most stable DAG is the user activity. So um, some numbers on these DAGs we have at the moment. The main DAGs we have uh, in, at, in my squad at the BBC. So the content metadata, we process around 200,000 records. They are initially around 12 gigabytes and we reduce, we extract the meaningful data and, and represent them in around 60 megabytes. Um, the user activity processes over 3.5 million records. Um, the output is around two gigabytes. Um, the train model, we build a model with, with some artifacts, which in total around eight gigabytes. And pre-compute recommendations were pre-computing for around 3.5 million users. Um, and the output is more or less 2.5 gigabytes. And the types of operators we use for those, uh, those uh, DAGs. So in the first case, we use mostly Python operator. The second case, we use uh, mostly data flow operator. So we deal, in the first case, we actually process inside the Airflow executor. The second one, we delegate most of the work to uh, Apache Bean. Um, in the third one, we delegate to a pod in Kubernetes, so it's quite isolated. Um, and the last one, we also use Dataflow. So, as I said, the most stable one is the ingest user activity. Um, between October um, 2020 and April 2021, we had one live incident related to each. And the other ones, we had more or less two live incidents. Um, or issues related to them. Um, I will be presenting some of these issues we had, and, and I have the hope more people who might see this presentation would be able to avoid the same issues. Um, so let's see the things which went wrong with our pipelines. So the ingest content metadata, which uh, someone thought might be the most stable of our DAGs, um, we actually had alerts related to it, and the bug was on it as well. Um, so the goal of this DAG was to retrieve data from AWS S3. Uh, we were going to use other options of services, such as the Google Cloud Transfer Service, but um, the, the bucket where we're extracting this information is protected by um, a secret uh, strategy from AWS called SGS, and we couldn't find another efficient way of doing that. Um, and we just wanted to have some quick way of just transferring the data across so we could build our stack. Um, this will soon be replaced by a proper ingest pipeline with Kafka and a proper consumer, which will scale in a nicer way. Um, but at the moment, we ingest around between dozens and thousands of kilo kilobyte sized objects. We filter and enrich the metadata we get. And uh, we merge multiple documents into the representation, which makes sense for us. And each of these boxes was implemented as a Python operator. So what that means is that the actual processing is happening on the Airflow executor, which is used by the scheduler to delegate work. Uh, this was the first DAG my squad implemented, and it is a naive approach, but we were still trying to learn how to use Airflow by the time. So as some might expect, one of the key issues with this approach of using the native Python operators running inside the executor is that since the amount of documents is variable that we're ingesting, uh, that leads to the DAG taking long times if there are lots of documents, little time if there aren't many documents. And when this happens, you can see there are these peaks of almost three hours. Um, that means that that Airflow executor is actually blocked, just doing this. And if we had several of those 
uh, executors performing this type of task, we would be at a risk of not executing other jobs. In this case, we limited the amount of concurrent DAG runs for this, this DAG, uh, but it, it, is, it has an issue. Um, so we had a few performance issues with this. Uh, initially, we attempted to increase some timeouts. We improved the machine types. We were running the executors. But in reality, the proper solution, which is in our backlog, is to le delegate the processing of this to another service. And that's what we did in the following DAGs we ended up building. So there came the user activity DAG, which is normally the more well-behaved DAG we have as part of this work. So um, it reads user activity in the Parquet file uh, from a Google Cloud storage bucket. Um, it filters relevant activity. It exports snapshots and it processes millions and millions of records. And we implemented it using mostly Apache Beam, um, delegating to data flow within Google Cloud to process it. As it can be observed from the task duration here, uh, the times are really predictable. There aren't massive peaks, so the job tends to, to happen between 20 and 25 minutes uh, without many surprises. And uh, one of the issues we had uh, was quite an interesting issue because All the activity that about the problem only when we were actually training the model, when another DAG, the following DAG was triggered. And uh, the issue happened just to this point when we were uh, the data set uh, to keep, the, so we would be able to train the model. And um, so we saw that we were not able to shape the data to train the model. And uh, we noticed that uh, there had been two task runs of the user activity, which would be creating the user files, uh, the user activity files needed to train the model. What happened in this case was that data flow took longer than expected to run the job triggered by airflow airflow considered timed out and said okay i give up you didn't manage to do that task data flow i'm asking you to do it again so with the retry it submitted the request to data flow to run it again uh, data flow was not aware that airflow had given up on its first scheduling of the job so what ended up happening was that the two jobs successfully run and they output to the data in the same target directory. So we ended up having twice the amount of data we would normally have to train the model. And the mod, the infrastructure that was set there wasn't expecting twice the user activity of the last four months. So, um, the model training couldn't process that massive amount of data because it wasn't smart enough to tell there was duplicated data. Um, this led to us uh, trying hard to have most of our tasks and DAGs idempotent, in the sense that if they give, if they receive some input, they would always output the same thing. And the way we implemented this um, was basically before running a task see where it's planning to output things and clear that directory for instance which is a naive approach more things can still go wrong uh, but in this particular case it could have avoided the issue um, in this particular case which involves data flow we also came up with another solution to handle the problem but uh, to to have tasks idempotent helped significantly with the stability of the workflows we were building. Um, so another obstruction, another issue we had. So I already commented the program metadata one, the content metadata one in the user activity. And this was an incident which we received an alert that we were unable to pre-compute recommendations 
but the underlining issue was started in train model. So this was the failing DAG where we pre-compute recommendations. So this task basically gets uh, millions of users, gets the model, and then applies an inference to try to guess which content will be available for which user. Um, and then we, we adapt that data so we can then serve it through a Regis cache. Um, in this particular case, one and another important thing is the train model triggers the pre-compute DAG once it finishes. So in theory, we would only be trying to pre-compute things if the model had been successfully trained. Um, but in this particular case, the failure we had in the pre-compute recommendations was um, it simply couldn't find the machine learning model we had trained in the previous DAG. Um, and initially we thought, how come this? We tried to reach the, the GCS bucket where it should be. It wasn't there. So we, we then went to investigate what could be wrong. And it was quite interesting because the train model, DAG, was completely green. So we wouldn't expect the train model step, which is the one which uh, creates the data, which will then be transferred to GCS by this other task, move model to G GCS. We didn't expect that to have failed. And when we went to check what happened with this task, which moves moved the model from the Kubernetes NFS file system to GCS, we realized it had a few retries attempts. And what happened is um, these particular tasks were implemented using um, Kubernetes pod operator. And two of them sort of run concurrently. So when, during the first attempt of running this task of moving the data, um, our Kubernetes cluster was struggling a bit. And this led to the pod staying pending for a long, long time. And the first attempt of running that task failed from an airflow perspective. So because it thought, you know what, this pod is taking too long. I'm aborting. But at least the version we are we're using for this Kubernetes pod operator, it aborted for airflow. But Kubernetes was still, still trying to schedule that job in a pod. Uh, then Airflow moved on, just retrying for a second time and sending a new pod to, to Kubernetes, which eventually worked. But from a Kubernetes perspective, these two tasks were there to be run. And in this particular case, they run concurrently. And that was a case we were not expecting. So when these two jobs run concurrently, the consequence was um, one deleted the data that the other was meant to copy. And in the end, nothing was copied. Um, so um, the GK node pool was struggling. The Airflow Kubernetes pod operator timed out after a long time waiting. The new task retry was triggered. Both pods run concurrently. Um, so some of the solutions we came for this sort of problem. Uh, we adopted a new version of the Kubernetes pod operator uh, where there is some sort of timeout. And we started using sensors to try to capture. Uh, no, 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 wait, sorry, I just confused. So the solution might be to use a newer version of the Kubernetes pod operator. And it might be worth sometimes to confirm by the end of the task, if the desired artifacts are there. Because if we're doing this type of check, then we wouldn't have said the train model DAG succeeded because it actually didn't. Um, another type of obstruction of issue that we faced in my team. So while we were training the model, the DAG failed and the bug was there as well. So this happened when we upgraded from Airflow 110.4 to 110.12. Uh, we noticed that some of the jobs we used to run in Kubernetes 
they started to become intermittent. And we could see that there were pods running. And sometimes, from our understanding from the logs, it felt new jobs were trying to reattach to previous pods which had already completed or failed, and they would fail together. Um, so this is how the issue looked like. So uh, the tag would fail in a task which was supposed to be running on Kubernetes. Um, this is an example of how we would see the error. So um, there would be some issue related to badge requests. And this started appearing only when we upgraded to, to Dataflow 110.12 uh, for the same code. So we eventually checked the release notes and things. Uh, we checked the documentation. And we saw there was this parameter, reattach and restart, uh, which was supposed to decide if once you retry a task which failed, if you should try to reattach to the same pod. And um, perhaps during this upgrade, since there was a huge gap, uh, the default value for this property might have changed. So what we ended up doing was just to say we didn't want the pod to reattach whenever we use this type of operator, and the issue was gone. Um, then another type of issue we came across while developing using Airflow to apply machine learning. So in the last step, when we pre-compute recommendations and we have the train model and we have both user activity and content metadata, we received an alert that pre-compute had failed and the bug was really there. So this is how the DAG looked like. And uh, it was quite an interesting issue because, again, we hadn't updated the code. The data seemed to be quite stable, but a DAG which used to be working fine, all of a sudden stopped working. And this was the error message we saw in Dataflow uh, where we were running this particular job. We compared the sizes of things since Dataflow told us there was no space left in disk. And things didn't seem significantly larger. They were actually almost the same size as a previous successful execution of the same job. Uh, and then we tried to investigate a bit further and we realized there were, depending on the options we were using for data flow, it would be limiting the disk size. The interesting thing was we hadn't changed the code, so these parameters weren't changed. We hadn't upgraded Jairflow by this time. So how could we be using the service which we, in theory, had opted out? Uh, we tried to monitor what was going on on the VMs which used to run this job. Um, and what we noticed was that uh, there were some unexpected configurations going on. And we noticed that a shuffle service, which previously was disabled by default, was being applied. And that was resulting in the configuration for data flow being different and the job therefore failing. So by the time we contacted Google Cloud and uh, there had been a break, a sort of breaking change to the data flow job, data flow service, where they simply switched what was the default behavior. So we ended up changing uh, to not use the shuffle service and then things went back to work. And then there is another quite interesting issue we had, uh, again, in the pre-compute DAG, where um, an a lower environment, which was not production, failed. And in many cases, people might not worry about notifications in the lower environments, right? So why should we give as much love and attention errors which happen in dev and inch. Sometimes they are very noisy. People are just developing and breaking things. Um, so our team was not looking very attentive to this channel because we had the issue of some non-production environments 
being a bit noisy. Um, and we had this incident. So um, Airflow gave up on communicating with this data flow job, uh, but the data flow job didn't give up on doing the task. And it was quite a disastrous bug because a job which usually would take up to five hours or usually much less ended up taking three hours, three days. Three days. Imagine if you have a spark, sir, a spark cluster and you leave some job running there for three days. And the way this job was set, it wasn't auto scaling. So we were setting really, really high uh, memory and CPU resources to execute this job. Um, so even though it did not affect production, it did cause the team some trouble. Uh, the way we ended up finding a solution to handle this more gracefully in the future is to use uh, the backport in Google Cloud operators in Apache Airflow. Um, and we started using newer versions of the data flow operator so we could uh, have some sort of timeout and cancel the job if things went very wrong. And um, this was quite interesting to, to have this sort of back porch uh, strategy, which I know is something adopted by the Airflow community. It allowed us to use newer versions of operators without necessarily um, having to to do the full upgrade, because sometimes a full upgrade can be disruptive. Um, so given these issues I presented, um, I would be curious on knowing which of these do people think was the one that costed the BPC more money to solve. So let's see. We will wait for some people to join. So you can join this quiz by joining this ahislides.com, six, Z, four, beta, beta. So we have 31 people who will be joining this quiz so far. Let's see if there are more, 29 people are giving up, not interested, this quiz is too boring. 32, we have more attendees. So I will start now the quiz in, Whoever is there, please let's see what your thoughts are. Ta -da. And you can have even rewards. Okay, so which do you reckon was the most costly issue we had? So processing programmatic data using Airflow executors, non-idepotent tasks, the breaking change when we upgraded Airflow, the breaking change in upstream service, in this case, data flow, or not monitoring efficiently pre-production. So I'm really pleased to see um, that most people answered um, it was not monitoring efficiently pre-production environments. That is the correct answer. Um, so the programmatic data one, it might be causing additional costs because we ended up having uh, instances with more CPU and memory than it, we would have to need for executors if they weren't actually processing data. But that cost isn't too as disastrous. The no idepotent tasks may just delay the execution of a few jobs uh, because things got broke, but that didn't necessarily relate to high costs. In the worst case, what we did was cleaning up things and then restarting the job. So it was usually a non very expensive job which had been affected by that. Breaking change after airflow upgrade, uh, that was relatively easy to spot. And even though we had that issue of reattaching the pods in Kubernetes and so on, uh, things stopped working. So it was some tasks stopped working. So it wasn't necessarily a massive cost for us. It was just fixing something which stopped working. 
the break in the data flow upstream service when they changed the shuffle service, it did cost something because we had some runs of the job which had a misconfiguration and they failed. So we paid for jobs which would never succeed, but they were too specific and limited to the duration of the tasks. Now, the job which lasted over three days, that was really, really disastrous cost-wise. So, wow, we have a few. Yarek is leading the leadership. Look, you even got this 80 points, which is amazing. So, um, so not monitoring officially in pre-production environments. Um, to give an idea of the cost, it cost the BBC over 12,000 pounds to have that job running, uh, which is really bad. Uh, but as you can say, I'm still talking to you. The team is fully there. We didn't have any apprentices to blame. So um, I think we learned from our mistakes and hopefully by seeing these numbers and these things, you it might save you and your company some money as well. Uh, some other things we learned uh, throughout the adoption of airflow for our problem. So initially, as anyone really using airflow, we wanted to have some Python packages so we could reuse things across our DAGs. Um, and initially, due to the way Google suggests we upload DAGs and plugins, by the way, here is DAGs and here is plugins. It's a mistake. Um, we we naively thought that the only way to, to send things to Composer was to use this interface. And by the time we adopted it, it didn't allow us to send folders, Python packages, which were not DAGs, or we were using it wrong. So we thought, oh, there is this plugins. That's the airflow way of delivering Python packages to share things across uh, DAGs. And that led to a path of lots of tears and pain. So um, once we adopted plugins, in, at least with Composer, um, and we use this command to, to send things. So we would uh, send the Cloud Composer environments, plugins uh, import and DAGs import to send things to Composer. Um, the way Composer serves the Airflow web server and the workers, the way they synchronize those files was not consistent. So very often we would see the explosion mushroom of broken things um, and things would not be synchronized. DAGs would stop working because they weren't being able to see the most recent versions of plugins. And we couldn't obviously enable the DAG serialization. So for us, the solution was give up on plugins, just use standard Python packages. And we used just uh, to, to just upload the files to the bucket, which Composer used to synchronize with its Airflow web server and executors and scheduler. And we adopted a very drastic approach of deleting all the DAGs, deleting everything that was there, all the packages, and then we copy over whenever we deploy. And even though this might lead to some issues, so far, this, this has been our safety path and things have been working quite well. And we have a predictable behavior during our deployments. Another thing where we learned, and for this, I think there is a brilliant um, both talk, but also a post by Astronomer uh, where they explain how to dynamically generate DAGs and some tips on how to manage configuration. Our initial approach was to use one environment variable per variable we wanted to retrieve per configurable thing. Um, and uh, we would use Terraform to set those environment variables in Composer. And then from the DAGs, we would be reading from the environment variable within the the um, operational system where things were running. Um, this led to several issues. Composer ended up doing much more than it should. We had redundant configuration across multiple DAGs. 
And it was really hard to have an overview of given this DAG or the set of DAGs, where is the data coming from and going to? So we adopted some configuration files and this post in Astronomer is really good. This blog post gives an idea of the path we ended up following. And we also ended up generating some of our DAGs dynamically. Uh, let me see. Ah, and another tip on this configuration driven approach is that, for instance, sometimes we used to disable DAGs clicking the button in the Airflow UI. Now we disable through configuration. And that's much safer because sometimes we would disable DAGs which are very expensive in each, for instance, and only enable when we wanted to try something. But if we just use the button, what would happen is that it would, even without catch ups, but because this DAG had been triggered by a previous DAG, the jobs would still be there waiting in the scheduler to be run. So whenever we enabled this, all those runs that we didn't want to have run would be started. So by using the configuration, we all together avoided triggering the DAG in the first place. So some takeaways. Um, keep processing out of our flow executors whenever you're processing data. Idea potency matters, and it can be quite tricky to get it right. I think we're still on the process of finding techniques to make it look nice. Um, sometimes it's hard to upgrade things, but there are some backporting our flow packages, which can be really handy. Uh, it's worth reviewing some release notes when we upgrade to avoid some breaking changes. And it is worth pre monitoring pre-production environments. Otherwise, you can spend tons of money. Um, we would also encourage, based on our experience, on Composer to avoid plugins. The delete deploy approach has worked fine for us. Um, and a configuration-driven approach where you can dynamically create DAGs has been quite successful for us as well. And I think more important than all these obstructions and issues I raised in this talk, it's quite important to see the value of Apache Airflow. So my team was able to and a contract with an external provider who used to serve recommendations for us. And the A-B tests we run uh, led to the outcome that our recommendation engine, which was huge thanks to, with the help of Apache Airflow, had 59% more of audience engagement. Uh, we are serving every day millions of personalized recommendations to the BBC audiences by using Apache Airflow in the process. And the fact we were able to create dynamic DAGs and configuration-driven uh, things have allowed us, if before it would take us, I don't know, um, a few months to get a new model launched, now the latest version, we're able to add some variants in five minutes. Um, so thank you very, very much.